to Accessible Art History, the podcast, Season 11. As mentioned in the trailer, this season will focus solely on women artists. Too often, they've been relegated to the sidelines of art and history. So, I want to feature them and teach you about how they overcame adversity to change the world around them. All images and sources will be in the associated blog post linked in the description details. Make sure to follow at accessible.art.history on Instagram for all updates. So, without further ado, let's get started. As with every episode in this season so far, I'll be discussing the life and works of an extraordinary woman. However, Edmonia Lewis is also the first woman of color I'll be showcasing. Of course, I wish I could have done so sooner, but unfortunately, there are not many women of color artists who have a significant amount of biographical information available until we reach the 19th century. However, she is an amazing woman to start the discussion off with. Her incredible talent, coupled with a passion for the past, has left us with some of the most beautiful works in all of art history. So to learn more, keep on listening. Edmonia Lewis was born around July 4th, 1844. There aren't many records about her early life, and it's been noted that Lewis's own information has been inconsistent. For example, she gave three different years for her birth, 1842, 1844, and 1845. She also didn't know her birthday. As with many other Americans who didn't know their exact birth date, she chose the nation's birthday as her own. There are some facts that our historians know for certain, though. Lewis was born into a free family in Greenbush, Rensselaer County, New York, and spent much of her childhood in New York, New Jersey area. Her mother, Catherine Mike Lewis, was of mixed race, African-American, and Mrs. Saugwa Ojibwe descent. Two different men has been named as her father. The first, Samuel Lewis, was of Afro-Haitian descent and worked in the area as a valet. The second was an author named Robert Benjamin Lewis. If Samuel Lewis was her father, then she had a half-brother with the same name. By the time she was nine years old, Lewis was an orphan. She and her possible half-brother were taken in by her two maternal aunts in Niagara Falls. Together, she and her aunts would sell embroidered shirts and moccasins, as well as woven baskets, to tourists visiting the area. At this point in her life, Lewis was known by her Ojibwe name, Wildfire. In 1852, Samuel left for California to see if he could strike it rich in the gold rush. He would send money home to help her pay for lodging and education. Four years later, Lewis enrolled in a pre-college program at New York Central College, a Baptist abolitionist school. She met several prominent figures there, and they encouraged her to pursue her artistic goals. According to her writing, Lewis was kicked out of the school after three years for being too wild, living up to her name. She said, quote, Until I was 12, I led this wandering life, fishing and swimming and making moccasins. I was then sent to school for three years, but was declared to be too wild. They could do nothing for me, end quote. Her brother Samuel, however, insisted that she continued her education. Lewis moved to Ohio to attend Oberlin Collegiate Institute, now known as Oberlin College. She was able to attend because this school was one of the first colleges to admit women and people of color. Despite this, she was only one of 30 students of color out of a population of around 1,000 students. So at this time, she began to go by the name Mary Edmonia Lewis instead of Wildfire. In 1862, Lewis's educational career would take a dark turn. That winter, two of her roommates, they lived in the home of Reverend John Keepin, his wife, and Lewis were going to go out to a sleigh ride with some young men. For the trip, she served Maria Miles and Christina Ennis cups of warm spice wine. Within a few hours, both girls were violently ill, and doctors feared they would not live. Thankfully, they did, but doctors suspected the girls had been poisoned, likely with Spanish fly, a reputed aphrodisiac. The news of the alarming incident swept through Ohio. Although Oberlin was a, quote, progressive area, not everyone was. One night, while walking home alone, Lewis was jumped by an unknown number of assailants. She was dragged into a field and beaten nearly to death and left to die. Instead of coming to her aid, local authorities charged her with the poisoning of the two women. John Mercer Langston, an Oberlin College graduate and the first African-American lawyer in Ohio, served as Lewis's representation for the case. He had his work cut out for him. Nobody wanted to speak in her defense, and numerous people spoke out against her. But Langston was a rational man. He was able to get the charges dismissed because he looked to science. He had doctors examine the stomach contents, and there was no sign of poison or Spanish fly found. Although the charges were dismissed, Lewis's time at Oberlin was awful. About a year after the first trial, she was accused of stealing art supplies. After that was dropped, Lewis was then accused of participating in a burglary. At this point, she knew it was time to leave a college. After three years of hard work, she left with no degree. Once again, Lewis's brother helped her move, this time to Boston. Despite the horrific abuse she endured at Oberlin, she was determined to become an artist. When she arrived in Boston, she made acquaintances with Edward Brackett, a local sculptor. He offered her a limited apprenticeship, and this set her path towards becoming a sculptor. 
Using connections she made with abolitionists, Lewis was able to gain sitters for her to practice with. William Lloyd Garrison, Charles Sumner, and Wendell Phillips all became subjects of portrait medallions. With practice, her ambition and skills grew. Eventually, Lewis sculpted portrait busts of two famous individuals. The first was of John Brown, an abolitionist who wasn't afraid to fight for the rights of others. He's most famous for his raid on Harper's Ferry. The other bust was of Colonel Robert Gould Shaw, who's a native Bostonian and the white leader of the famous and celebrated All-African-American 54th Regiment of the Civil War. When Lewis sold these busts, she was able to finance her first trip to Europe. Next, I want to dive into this big break in her career. But first, let's take a quick break. Let's dive in. Starting in London, Lewis traveled east to Paris and Florence. Eventually, she landed in Rome and decided to make a home there. She was recorded as saying, quote, I was practically driven to Rome in order to obtain the opportunities for art and culture and to find a social atmosphere where I was not consistently reminded of my color. The land of liberty had no room for a colored sculptor, end quote. Lewis rented an apartment and studio near the Piazza Barberini in the heart of the city. At this point in art history, the neoclassical style was all the rage. Artists came from all over Europe and America to view the Roman ruins and emulate the styles and stories of the past. Shortly after arriving, she made connections with the actress Charlotte Cushman and the sculptor Harriet Hosmer. This allowed her access to clients and resources that would have not been available otherwise. Lewis spent the majority of her adult life in Rome. Italians were less prejudiced against people of color, especially during the American Civil War period. In addition, she was a Catholic, and being in the city at the center of her faith brought her a sense of peace. Unlike other artists of the day, she did all the work herself. Typically, artists would create plaster casts to show to local stoneworkers and sculptors what to carve. This could be from a lack of initial funds, but Lewis was also known to be protective of her designs. This was rather unique for the period. She took the neoclassical style, but used it to depict first people and biblical themes. Eventually, Lewis's talent brought her commissions and fame. In 1873, an article in the New Orleans newspaper recorded that she had snared two $50,000 commissions. This was a huge amount of money at the time. In fact, her studio space even became a popular tourist destination. The next big break in Lewis's career came in 1876, the 100th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. That year, a centennial exposition was held in Philadelphia to celebrate. For the event, Lewis created one of her most famous works, The Death of Cleopatra. Weighing in at over 3,000 pounds, this piece is absolutely huge. The work shows Cleopatra in the moment of her death from a poisonous snake bite. Her body is weak, but she is still beautiful and regal. The folds of her dress and the details of her throne are rendered expertly. Showing this moment was highly unusual, though. Typically, artists showed Cleopatra contemplating her suicide, but instead, Lewis shows the completed act. This shocked viewers. Something so gruesome was rarely seen. Regardless of the shock sentiment, the death of Cleopatra drew a huge crowd at the exposition. In fact, critics stated that it was the best piece of American sculpture in the entire show. Sadly, in a great travesty, the work disappeared from public view for nearly a century. It wasn't sold during the exposition, nor during the later 1878 Chicago show. It was then purchased by a gambler named Blind John Condon, who used it as a grave marker for his favorite horse, obviously named Cleopatra. When the land of the racetrack was bought by the U.S. Postal Service, the statue was moved into a storage unit. It was badly damaged by a group of well-meaning Boy Scouts who tried to restore it. Eventually, the death of Cleopatra fell into the hands of the Forest Park Historical Society. In 1994, understanding that they had a national treasure, the Society donated the work to the Smithsonian. $30,000 was spent to restore the piece to its original glory. Today, it's one of the jewels of the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Lewis continued to sculpt for many years after the exposition. Her work, Hagar, also in the collection of the Smithsonian, captures the fear of the young maidservant as she is cast out of Abraham's tribe and into the desert. She also sculpted several works showing the first people's history and culture, including Old Arrow Maker and his daughter, Minnehaha, and Hiawatha. It is interesting to note that many of her figures, regardless of their origins, were shown with European features. Some historians believe that this was a conscious choice by Lewis to avoid any critics who said that she was only good at sculpting self-portraits. 
Lewis never married, and there's no evidence that she had children. Other details on her later life are scarce. It appears that she lived in Paris from 1896 to 1901. Then it appears that she moved to London, where she died on September 17, 1907, of kidney failure. In 2017, a GoFundMe was set up to restore her grave in St. Mary's Roman Catholic Cemetery in London. It was successfully funded, and a picture of the restored grave can be seen on my blog. Today, Edmonia Lewis is not only remembered for her amazing technique and neoclassical style, but for also being the first African-American sculptor to achieve national and international fame. In fact, in 2002, leading African-American studies scholar Malefi Kete Asante named her as one of the 100 greatest African-Americans. Make sure to tune in next week when I continue our discussion on women artists, the life and works of Augusta Savage. Thank you for listening to this episode of Accessible Art History, the podcast. New episodes will premiere each Monday, so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a rate and review. Make sure you follow Accessible Art History on Instagram at accessible.art.history for all updates and daily art of the day posts. See you next time!